Okay, hello everybody. Hello everybody, welcome. My name is Aslam Rauf. I'm the president of the Federalist Society of Northwestern University School of Law. And I'm Suzanne Alton. You guys have been getting my emails all, all week. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month. I am the president, along with Esteban, of the Latino Law Students Association. The Federalist Society is a nonpartisan, conservative, and libertarian organization dedicated to freedom, <coughs> federalism, and judicial restraint. The Federalist Society seeks to educate the legal community through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government based on the rule of law can have a positive effect on law and public policy. Um, I would like to briefly mention a couple of upcoming events we have. Next week on Tuesday, October 23rd, Clark Neely will be visiting the law school to talk about whether judges should actually be more activists than they are right now. And uh, on Monday, October 29th, we're having a debate um, between Professor Michael Lewis, who's a former Navy pilot, and Northwestern's Professor Stephen Sawyer about drone strikes and targeted killings. Um, so please uh, be sure to make your plans to be with us for those. Uh, and likewise, uh, LASA, uh, we will continue into next week, and we do have a couple of additional upcoming events, uh, aside from the programming that we've already had this week. Next Tuesday, we will have a working abroad panel, and we will uh, have a student-led discussion about those folks who have been working in Latin America for Latin American or uh, firms in the United States with branches in Latin America, talking about that experience. And then next Thursday, we are going to have a discussion on doing business with Latin America and how people have built their practices doing business with Latin America here in the United States. All right, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I will introduce Stuart Anderson, who's here on behalf of the Federalist Society. He is the executive director of the National Foundation for American Policy. He is the former director of trade and immigration studies at the Cato Institute. He's worked on immigration policy on Capitol Hill, uh, including for Senator Sam Brownback and Senator Spence Abraham. And he's the author of a book on immigration titled Immigration. Okay, and on behalf of LASA, Josh Karsh is joining us today. Josh is a very modest man, and so I will keep this a very modest introduction. Um, he is with the law firm in Chicago, Hughes, Sokol, Pierce, Resnick, and Dim. He litigates labor and employment matter, civil rights cases, consumer protection matters, and also handles uh, Seventh Circuit appellate cases. He also serves on the board of director of the Chicago Lawyers Committee <coughs> for Civil Rights, uh, and he uh, received his JD from the University of Chicago, our, uh, our rivals on the south side. So, all right, I think without any further ado. I think uh, Mr. Anderson is going to speak first, followed by Mr. Marsh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for question and answer. So please join me. Well, thank you very much to the Federal Society uh, and the Latino uh, Law Students Association for, uh, for having us here. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, Josh and I are a little disadvantaged because I know a lot of you've been watching the presidential debates, and I don't know that we're going to have, you know, be able to reach that standard uh, of discourse. My turn. <laughs> <laughs> I know because <clears throat> we, we didn't really have enough time to investigate each other's uh, pension investments, for example. <clears throat> Although I, I figured out Josh somehow was investing in a North Korean stock market, which I don't even know exists. So. But um, yes, and we promised to, uh, when each other is speaking, to make sarcastic uh, you know, gestures and smile inappropriately. I'll let Joe, I'll, I'll let Joe Biden occasionally. The, uh, we're, where I think the two of us differ, I think we're both basically both pro-immigration, but where, where we differ is, and what we're gonna focus on, what we think the most important reforms uh, to the immigration system should be. Uh, and, uh, and I think the value of these types of discussions is for when you're you know, reading the newspaper, or seeing stuff on TV, to have some context in which to view these. And I think one of the most, and that's why I think the most important reform that could be made uh, is to allow people to come in legally through legal visas to work, particularly at lower end jobs. Uh, I think most people are amazed uh, to know that there really is not any legal way for someone to come in and work at what some would consider a, a, a job that does not require a high school degree, uh, that's a full year job. Uh, here are the only temporary visas that are out there that even come close to that category. There's something called H-2B visas, which are limited to about 66,000 a year, uh, and that's only for seasonal kind of resort type work uh, in many cases, and it's not full year. Uh, and then there's H-2A, which is for agricultural guest workers, 
Uh, and those folks can only uh, come in for part of the year. Uh, and, and the system is considered so bureaucratic that even though there's actually no numerical limitation on it, that neither the potential employee or the employers use the system that much, particularly compared to the number of people in the country legally who are working uh, in agriculture. Now, it hasn't always been this way. It's very interesting. Back in the 1950s, there became a big concern about illegal entry into the United States from Mexico. So there was an INS commissioner at the time named General Swing who um, said to the growers, look, we're going to crack down on illegal entry at the border, but at the same time, we're going to make it easier for you to use what was called the Bracero Program, which was an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, and that's really what he did. He, he had the, they, at the same time the INS uh, instituted the politically incorrectly named uh, Operation Wetback, uh, they, when, they, when they did that, they also made it easier for, for, for farmers, uh, for growers to use people to come in to work in, uh, uh, on their farms. And the result was a social science experiment, like, where the results were so clear, it's almost like a, you've never seen anything like this. From 1953 to 1959, the, the number of the apparatus at the border, which are kind of the, the best way to, uh, to assess uh, illegal entry, uh, fell by 95%. By 95% from 1953 to 1959. And what that shows us is that when people are offered a legal avenue, they acted rationally and they came in. Now, there were problems with the Reserve Program in terms of people uh, you know, possibly being exploited, uh, but that doesn't mitigate against the idea that you can design systems that maybe take, that take care of those kind of situations, but while also <coughs> taking advantage of, of the power of the market, which allows employers to match up with potential employees to do so in a legal way, and that takes out really the black market in labor. <clears throat> now, the, the Bracero program ended up ending by 1964. There were concerns particularly with the, with, the, with the farm workers unions. So it ended in 1964. After that, we started to see illegal immigration increase dramatically. Uh, illegal, 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 illegal entry uh, skyrocketed and, and illegal immigration, <laughs> including not only in agriculture, but obviously in, in other types of jobs uh, where, there were no, where there was no other uh, visa category uh, also increased dramatically. So what, what was the U.S. solution to that? Well, by 1990, they decided there were about 3.5 million people in the country illegally. So there became a dramatic increase in the Border Patrol. What was the result of that? Well, there's a kind of a rule in Washington. If something uh, isn't working, you spend dramatically more money on it. And that's exactly what happened with the combating illegal immigration. Uh, the, the Border Patrol increased dramatically, uh, almost a, a fourfold or fivefold increase between, uh, between 1990 and today. And illegal immigration increased from 3.5 million to about 11 million today. What happened? Well, as it became increasingly more dangerous, and difficult to get into, and, to be, and somewhat difficult. It took maybe a couple more, another try or two to get into the country. Once people got in, they stayed. So you ended up t taking, having the unintended consequences of taking what was essentially a circular migration, uh, where people would come, work for a while, get some money, and go back, and to make people, make it a permanent situation where people would come and then have families here, and we're even seeing that today, uh, <clears throat> when we still see the debate about things like the, the DREAM Act, where people end up bringing, bringing their kids uh, into the country because they had no intention. They figured out they weren't going to be able to go, go back and forth. Um, what have been the consequences of, of, of this? Well, politically, we see things like in Arizona and Alabama, the state legislation, uh, state legislation, even Supreme Court case, uh, because states feel that they're dealing with the ramifications of this even though they have no control over what's, uh, what's happened at the federal level. Secondly, economically, you see a problem where, whether it's in Washington State, where they can't, where they have trouble uh, picking apples, in Georgia with onions, where they've tried to crack down in the state 
on, on illegal immigrants. Uh, you know, in other, in other type of industries where you're just not able to get enough workers, or at least not get them legally, uh, and they're also become massive dead weight um, costs in the economy where employers constantly have to deal with audits and things like that from, from the Immigration Service. But I don't, what, I, what I'd really like to focus on, though, is the human cost, which almost never gets discussed. Um, I did a study in uh, 2010 where I looked at, at migrant deaths at the border, which are a direct result of the lack of a legal way for people to come in and work. Uh, as of 2009, over 4,000 people had died uh, near the U.S. border trying to come in to the United States and essentially to work. That's just since, uh, that was since uh, 1998, since it was kept, being kept track. Since I, since I did that study, there's been another 1,000 people uh, who, who died. And, and what's really amazing about this and disturbing is that illegal entry at the border has been decreasing quite significantly in the, in the past number of years. So uh, such that uh, the Congressional Research Service uh, basically figured out that you're looking, that it's actually, you're, four, you're about four or five times more likely to die trying to enter the United States now than maybe just 10, maybe just 10 years ago. And the type of cases that have happened are, are you know, are, kind of gut-wrenching. Gut there was a case of uh, 24 people who were led by, uh, by a coyote into, into the uh, United States, and the person really didn't know what they were doing or didn't really care. Uh, increasingly, almost um, most migrations now, uh, illegal migration is, is being run by cartels who are, uh, you know, have people working for them to bring people in. So we basically take empowered criminal enterprises. Uh, but in this case, uh, about 12 of the 24 people died because they were just let out to the desert. The person didn't, you know, didn't, either didn't care or didn't, didn't know, uh, you know how to get them to safety. Uh, and, and there was a case in May 2003 where 70 th 73 people were put in a tractor trailer. Many of you may remember this case. And uh, there was no air conditioner um, and really no air circulation. And they, the best they could do was poke a little bit of water few holes in the back of it and they even carried up a five-year-old to the front so it would get some of the, the modest amount of air but it wasn't enough and, and the child died and, and, and overall uh, 19, 19 people died there. I mean these kind of cases get headlines but still we don't really see, we haven't really seen a, a, a real solution to it and, the, and the, really the best solution is going to be to have legal ways for people to come in and work. Uh, at, the, at these jobs, and we can discuss later what, what alternatives there are for doing that. So one would think, well, if we, we don't, obviously we don't make it easier for people to come in at these, these lesser skilled jobs, that means we must really emphasize making it easier for people to come in at the higher skilled jobs. Well, no, that's not, that's not the case either. Um, at the higher end, it's an extremely complicated uh, system. Uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, for those of you interested, has a, uh, has a book on just dealing with high skill immigration, it's, which is advice, and advice to other lawyers. It's a 2,000 page book that could easily be used as a self-defense uh, weapon for anyone who, who needs one. Uh, and you know, some of the procedures, they, such as when you sponsor someone for a green card, you have to go through this, something called labor certification where, you, where it makes employers put out advertisements and things like that. Just that can take over 300 pages in the book just to explain it to other practicing attorneys. Uh, some of the problems with this, well, uh, usually for someone when, say, someone's an international student and employer's interested in hiring them, they often will have to get um, an H-1B visa, which is a temporary visa, but typically those run out well before the end of the fiscal year. Sometimes, often before the end of the fiscal year, and sometimes before the start of the fiscal year, and this has happened for 10 years in a row. Uh, just recently, the 2013 fiscal year um, just just started in October 1st, but all of the visas for the year had already been used up uh, by, by June and July, uh, which meant that if anyone was going to get a new H-1B, they couldn't start working for 15 months uh, in the future. So again, that's not really practical for a lot of people, uh, but you know they may be able to bear it. Uh, on the green card, wait, the green card is is the next is allows someone to stay here permanently. Now, if you're on an H-1B visa, 
it's important because you can wait here and keep working while your case is being processed. But the problem is, is they have uh, numerical limits and also they even have per country limits, such that I calculated uh, that if someone's from India and in the most typical employment-based category, the, the number of people in the backlog is about 210,000. Um, and typically only about 3,000 people get out of that backlog every year. So do the math. That's a theoretical wait of 70 years uh, for someone to get their green card. Obviously that, that can't be sustained um, and, and something needs to be done if, if that's gonna be possible. Uh, finally, I would say um, on entrepreneurs, one would think we'd at least make it easier for entrepreneurs to get here, job, job creators, everyone loves job creators, right? Well, no, nope, that's not the case either. Uh, uh, I did a, a study last year where I looked at the top uh, 50 venture funded uh, companies in America and uh, almost half of them had been started by an immigrant uh, immigrant in the company. Uh, one, of, one of the companies, um, it was the story, I, the story was about the two Iranian students who were in grad school at the University of Maryland. They had an idea for, for a software company. And when they went to the, they had won, like came in second in an entrepreneur contest. And the, when the attorneys started talking to them, he said, disband the company. You're not gonna be able to get to stay here on a temporary visa. They're not gonna, they're not gonna grant it. It's, it's, um, it's extremely difficult to get a, a kind of self-petitioned uh, visa. So forget it. He, I said it was the worst, worst day of his life. They, they're alive, they basically cried. Uh, they went their separate ways. Uh, two of them ended up getting back together in, in San Francisco. He had, one of them had actually won the diversity visa lottery, which is like an amazing thing to do. There's actually this, this 50,000 people a year can apply to get a green, in this green card lottery. So he was able to stay in the US through that. And they started fooling around with different Facebook applications and eventually it became uh, the single site called Zeusk, which uh, now has over 100 million uh, in uh, revenue every year, uh, like 20 something million monthly users. And, uh, and I mean, some people have asked me whether they, you know, is this a brain drain that we keep, that someone like that, someone like these people were able to, you know, stay in the U.S. I said, well, you know, look, they were from Iran. I mean, I don't know that they would have created the hottest single site in the, you know, in the country in Iran. And, but, but the main thing is that the U.S. did give them, give them an opportunity finally, but it was a very indirect backdoor opportunity. And, and it's, it's a credit to, to many of the people who were able to persevere, whether it's at the high end or at the low end uh, of the job spectrum and able to find a way uh, to be able to work in, in the country even though we don't make it easier for them. So those are the two reforms that I think would be most important to the, to the immigration system. Um, how many people in this room are first or second generation in this country? Could you raise your hand? My position that immigration is one of the greatest triumphs of the United States. We do it very poorly, but it is one of the things that is also, to my mind, we should be proud of stuff. How many people have taken a class in immigration law? Not that many, okay. So I wanna start out by saying what is different, fundamentally different about immigration law than most of the, I'm a lawyer, of most of the topics that we do study in law school. If you study liberal democratic politics or constitutional theory in modern America, you start with the presumption of a community with defined borders. And the question that gets posed typically is what, do, what obligations do acknowledged members of the community owe to each other? How can we treat each other contractually in non-contractual relationships what is equal protection of the laws among acknowledged members of the community? Immigration law turns the tables entirely. The interesting questions in immigration law are about how we treat unacknowledged members of the community and what rights, if any, we have to treat them differently. And so it's a really different perspective than we typically have in common law or constitutional law classes. Now, I'm gonna 
outline at the end of this the four reforms that I think are most pressing and needed. But I wanted to start first with a couple things. And one was what I think are some prevalent myths about immigration in this country. So we live right now in a fairly unusual moment. Stuart talked to you about how in the 50s up till 1964 we get a Bracero program and then in 64 the program ended and then we saw a surge in unauthorized or illegal immigration because there were no visas or work authorizations from the Bracero program anymore. True. But one of the interesting things to me about that is until very recent years, whether we had legal visa guest worker programs or very heavily restricted immigration, we had about the same flow of people coming to this country from Mexico year in and year out. It really didn't matter all that much in terms of the flow what the legal regime was. They could come legally, they could come illegally, but the demand was about the same. What's unusual in the last couple years, really, is that that has stopped. We, for the very first, we are not currently in, in, I have to apologize, immigration is not only about Mexicans, it is the area that I know the most about, and so it's the one I'm most comfortable talking about. And I think it's the one that domineers a lot of the debate in this country right now. But we currently have a net outflow, not a net inflow of migrants to this country. And it's the first time in a very long time in this country that that's been true. So for people who have said in the past, we can have comprehensive immigration reform after we get a handle on the problem and we stop the flow, that time is now. We actually have a net outflow right now. Now, why do we have a net outflow and what makes people come here in the first place? So for the past four years, actually, migration has been at net zero. And to give you an idea of what that means, um, the best estimates we have right now that I'm aware of are there are about 100,000 illegal border crossings a year right now. And obviously, that's a hard number to get reliably uh, because most border crossings that are not authorized are more successful if they're under cover of night and you can't see them. But the best estimate we have is about 100,000 in 2010. That's down from 525,000 every year between 2000 and 2004. Now, why are fewer people coming and what impels people, and again, I apologize, I'm primarily talking about Mexico, what impels people to come from Mexico to the United States in the first place? It is not, by and large, the desire to reside permanently in this country. And we know that in a whole bunch of ways. One is that historically, the people who come to the United States from Mexico are not family units. They tended to be males with families in Mexico that they left behind, who they fully intended to join and go back to again. That's not an indication that you're coming here to come here permanently or to get welfare benefits or anything else. Stewart spoke about circularity, and that is what we used to see. People would come and they would return. Why would they come? Well, in part for work and because of wage differentials. There were better paying jobs here. But that wasn't the only thing. There's a guy named Doug Massey at Princeton University who's done a lot of work and has found that differentials in interest rates are actually a much better predictor and indicator of how many people will come than differentials in wages. In Mexico, there is no mortgage system like we have. And loans are much harder to come by. So a lot of Mexicans who came to this country came with the intention of either building or acquiring a house. But to get the capital to do that, they came here because they could earn it faster and because they couldn't borrow it in Mexico. So one of the things that motivated an awful lot of immigration, which tended to be temporary, was the missing credit market in Mexico. We, beginning in about 2000, started to fortify, is that accurate? Fortify the border much more heavily than we ever had before. 
here's a lesson in unintended consequences. It increased the population of undocumented residents of the United States. It increased the population of undocumented residents of the United States dramatically because of circularity. When we fortified the border, we made it much more difficult for people to go back and have confidence that they could come again the next season. So they stayed. The idea of fortifying the border was to lower the number of undocumented residents in the United States. If that was the intention, it didn't work. It had exactly the opposite effect. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, um, the best economic evidence we have is also that immigration does not tend to take work away from American workers and is not a drag on the economy. You will find it very difficult to find a consensus among any large number of economists that migration and immigration is a net drag on the economy. Here is, to my understanding, our best understanding of what happens. Particularly from Mexico, we tend to attract low-wage workers. There are some people who believe that developed capitalist economies create a need for a pool of low-wage workers that they can never satisfy by themselves. There may be truth in that. They tend to take jobs in the American workforce that Americans do not want or will not accept. That's not just farm working jobs, although it is farm working jobs. Almost all the produce that you eat that is grown in this country is picked by migrant farm workers. Very few Americans pick that fruit and harvest. Lots of those migrant farm workers are my clients, and I'll talk to you about how they get treated in a minute. Um, but there are also a bunch of things that happen. So they come and they tend to fill jobs that are not in competition with American laborers. And they also, of course, just by being here, stimulate demand for other goods and services which they themselves purchase. The other related thing is that population demographics has something called a replacement rate. In order to keep population levels stable within a country, it's been calculated that a woman has to have 2.3 children. We are now in this country below that rate. Europe and Japan are way below that rate. Japan is 1.3. Europe hovers generally around between 1.3 and 1.5, depending on the country. We're at about two now. As the baby boomers retire and leave the workforce, we will have a declining workforce. We will have fewer and fewer workers without immigration. We probably need immigrants to keep workforce levels up. Now, let me talk a little bit about what I think the most needed reforms are. Um, at the top of my list, but I think not at the top of Stewart's, is legalization. Some people call it amnesty. It is also amnesty. For some people, yeah. No, five minutes. OK. But for a whole <laughs> bunch of people, I think that's a misleading term, and let me tell you why. There are about 11 million undocumented residents of the United States right now. About 3 million of them came here as children. The only thing they did wrong was to follow or obey their parents. They made no decision to violate laws or anything like that. And for many of them, this is the only country they have ever known. Legalization for them, for me, is a very pressing need. That's three million people. Now, there are eight million people who may have come here as adults, some of them their parents. We're not about to deport three million people or eight million people or 11 million people. Americans don't have the stomach for it. It's not clear how we could accomplish it. So what's the option to not legalizing them since we're not going to remove them? It's the creation of a permanent underclass. You deny them the ability to get uh, tuition grants and uh, school aid, and you keep them in low-wage jobs, and you make them create black market economies because they can't always lawfully participate in other markets. From a policy perspective, it seems to me to be a little bit insane. So legalization is at the top of my list. 
Um, what do you do with the adults? The dreamers are politically the most palatable, right? They came here as kids. They generate a lot more sympathy than adults do. Um, for adults, you could legalize just outright. <coughs> um, that wouldn't bother me at all, but I think that it probably is not politically saleable. What is politically saleable is a point system by which adults can earn citizenship points by serving in the military, doing community service, having a clean record, and things like that. The longer you do it, the more points you would have. The second thing that I would like to see and see imminently is not just an increase in the number of worker visas, but a fundamental change in the terms of those visas. H H-2A and H-2B visas right now are employer-based. You get a piece of paper that says that you can come to this country to work for a specific and particular employer, and you violate the terms of the visa if you stay here, even during the term of the visa, and work for anybody else. It's employer-specific. That creates an exploitable workforce, right? Their only ticket here is staying with that employer no matter how long uh, or how badly they're abused. The things that I see in my practice amaze me. In order to get uh, H-2A workers to this country, those are agricultural workers, you have to get what's called a clearance order from the Department of Labor. You promise the Department of Labor, number one, that you have advertised for U.S. domestic workers and been unable to attract them. And number two, that you will pay what's called the adverse effective wage rate. It's a specified wage set by the federal government. You swear under oath you're going to pay that wage. I get clients coming to my office. They're not getting paid anywhere near that wage. But they can't do anything about it because they can't leave and go to another employer, which is you know, letting the market operate and remedying the situation. The third thing that I'd like to see is an end to civil immigration detention. Um, being out of status in this country, that is being here without papers or being here without legal authorization, is not a criminal violation under our laws. It is a civil administrative violation. But if you are picked up by ICE, you are held in custody in a detention center. Now think back to criminal procedure if you take it. You are held in custody for a civil violation and you have no bond hearing. Nobody ever assesses whether you are a flight risk. We detained 390,000 people last year in this country on that basis. We did it at a cost of $164 per detainee per day, totaling $2 billion. Ankle bracelets would be a hell of a lot cheaper. A hell of a lot cheaper. And most of these people aren't flight risk. After all, the premise of most people who look at this is that these people want to stay here. They're not leaving. <laughs> the last thing, and I think Stuart probably knows a lot more about this than I do, that I would like to see is a removal of what are called per country caps. We currently cap the number of immigrants who will get visas to come to this country, about 20,000 for most countries. Um, and that's out of line with demand, and it's also, I think, not a rational way to do it. On the one hand, um, we share a 2,000-mile border with Mexico. There are a lot more people who want to come here from Mexico than from other countries. Our policy ought to reflect that. At the same time, um, there are, to be totally stereotypical about it, in the popular press, you'll read that there are a lot of Indian PhDs and Chinese PhDs who want to come to this country and work, but once they hit 20,000, we can't take any more. We're turning people away who would be, by everybody's agreement, in our interest to have here working. Okay? Thanks. Great. Well, I think that, I mean, as far as the, the reforms that Josh suggested, um, again, we had a difference in emphasis, I think, again, to save lives at the border and to have a more economically uh, viable way to have people come to the country and eliminate the black market. Adding more uh, visas at the low end, I think, is the most important reform. I am very open to the idea of a completely different way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I, I had written a paper a few years ago 
that act had the endorsement of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So it's not something. That, so this idea is not something that's like businesses would never go for. Uh, the idea would be you create portable work visas, uh, and uh, they could be done in a couple ways. You could have, uh, in addition to a, a certain pool of them, uh, I would suggest you actually add in a feature where you negotiate with another country and get uh, immigration enforcement uh, agreements, for example, with Mexico, and then you can go down a list to other countries, El Salvador, and other countries. And what you would get is it would be the only political, politically feasible way for some of these other countries to actually cooperate with the uh, U.S. and discourage people from coming illegally into the United States. Uh, Mexico actually did it for a short time during some of the, the most hazardous travel times, and Vicente Fox was prepared to actually do this if there had been a, a U.S.-Mexico uh, migration deal, uh, but you know it turned out it, it, they weren't able to do that after 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 9/11 happened. But but it was something that that was heavily discussed. Um, I think that to the extent we don't do that, uh, I'm certainly very open to re to making reforms of, of all the existing visa categories. But the problems with the existing visa categories, in addition to not making it easy for someone to go from one employer to another, um, they actually only take into account a fraction of, of the types of jobs that people who are in the country legally actually work at. Um, the type of jobs that most people work at are kind of full year jobs that are in restaurants, hotels, and other places in which the employer has an ongoing need. The current visa categories we have really only take into account the primarily seasonal needs. Um, as far as legalization, um, I would be in favor of legalization if it was part of a, of a, broader, of a broader deal that allowed the reforms to be made uh, to help to have a, a new legal visa system for people to come in at, at, at these lower skilled jobs. I think that once you, once you do the legalization, if you don't have the other the other aspect to it, one, you won't be able to get it on its own, the legal visas, and two, for the long term, even though I agree with you that we are seeing this kind of drop in, in migration from Mexico, we don't know what's going to happen uh, with A, with other countries, and B, um, if, as the, if the economy really improves in the United States, um, and, and plus with the, with the border deaths, um, you really need to have a system for people to come in uh, legally. Uh, on legalization, one of the arguments in favor of it is actually that uh, really about three quarters of the people who are in the country uh, not in legal status have been here a decade or more, uh, eight to ten years or more. So it's very unlikely that these people are, are going to leave and, they, and they've, they've set down roots. Uh, it is an interesting dichotomy we're going to see between what to, what to do with people who came in as children versus adults. Um, it would be very interesting if there are solutions that deal with the two populations in a different way. Um, for example, would, would people be willing to accept a solution where people who came in as children would go all the way through and be able to get you know, permanent residence and citizenship, but people who are not, who did not come in uh, who came in as adults would be able to would be able to get legal status, but short of becoming citizens. Um, that's going to be that would be one avenue of the debate. And quite frankly, it's somewhere where I actually see the debate debate going. Uh, in some ways, it's a victim of the success of the people who are who've been advocating on behalf of the Dream Act people because they made that that, that group uh, you know much more uh, you know. Sympathetic in people in people's eyes. Uh, finally, I would say on the high school, yes, the per country limit is a big, is a key reform. Um, that's that's why you saw that figure I talked about the 70 years. That figure goes down to about 10 years um, if you had a, if you eliminate the per country per country limit. Um, and and in one of the other categories, it would go down to a couple of years uh, for people from India and China. So that would be uh, an, another key reform. Um, Again, I think that the key, though, is you need to have, um, if you want to eliminate uh, illegal behavior, have a legal avenue that people can use. And, um, if you, and if you want to have a system that takes into account that one half to two thirds 
of the degrees and masters and PhDs in high tech fields are earned today at US universities by foreign nationals. Um, unless you want to say we want all of those people to go somewhere else rather than those who they're a good fit in the country to be able to stay here, um, you know, you should have a system in place uh, that makes that possible. Questions? You know, I, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, can you speak up? Yes. Do you see any benefit in creating an avenue for people that come year in and year out to actually convert those temporary visas to permanent residency? I mean, because they're taking all their income back to Mexico or back to Latin America, wherever they're coming from. Um, they have their family back there and they're contributing to our country. So do you see a benefit in kind of creating that legal avenue for them to eventually? It wouldn't bother me, but I wouldn't presume that they want to stay here. I mean, I actually think it would be good to have some portion of the, you know, in other words, if you had, you know, if you added 50,000 visas, you know, and add an extra 10 or 20 on the permanent side, um, because I think that one concern people have is about people overstaying the visas. I don't actually think that that's a serious concern in the work, in the work area, but, to the extent that they would, again, solve the problem by having a legal way for people who are a good match between themselves and you know and, and their employer in the U.S. marketplace. You mentioned that you believe that immigration is not a net drag on the U.S. Yes. But isn't the reason why Arizona passed a really harsh um, immigration laws is because their criminal justice and education and healthcare systems couldn't afford the Ill illegal immigrants? I think there's very little evidence of that. Um, undocumented residents of Arizona are about 6% of the population. I don't think they were that kind of drab, and these numbers are exceptionally hard to come by. Okay, so take it all with a little grain of salt. But I, we have a large immigration practice in my law firm. Um, in our experience, about 70% of undocumented people who come to see us are getting W-2 wages. They're paying taxes. They're funding those services. Um, so it's not a drag in the, in the sense of unfunded. Um, it is true, and it was part of what I think drove Arizona to be so upset, that the burden falls much more heavily on states and local governments than it does on the federal government, because undocumented residents are pretty uniformly not eligible for federal benefits. Um, but they are more eligible for state and local benefits. Um, on the criminal justice, I'm particularly skeptical because I've never seen any evidence that somebody who's undocumented is more likely to commit a crime within this country than somebody who's not. In fact, the contrary. If you look at the 390,000 people a year who are detained in civil detention centers for civil administrative violations, half of them have no criminal record whatsoever, and about a third of the rest are picked up on a movie violation. So I think it's a myth that um, undocumented residents living in this country um, are more likely to commit crimes than other people, or more likely to file crimes for benefits. I, I think, and I think on that, on your question, I think I think it's important, and, and it's something we didn't really see that much in the presidential debates um, on any of the issues, is to separate out the issue of government funding and government services and deficits from the economy overall. I mean, the private economy is employers matching up with employees, producing goods and services for consumers. The government, you know, the deficit or the budgets at states and federal levels involve taxes and what the government spends, spends money on. Uh, I mean, to the extent, if it was shown that Arizona had to dramatically increase taxes such that it would hurt economic activity because of people in the country illegally, you know, then, then you would potentially see a, a negative you know, a negative economic, uh, you know, action or, or because of it. But if it's really a matter of, if you're a consumer in Arizona and the employer was able to hire someone to fill a job in a restaurant and you were able to go to the restaurant that, that maybe wouldn't have been open otherwise or wouldn't have expanded, you know, as a consumer you would, you would benefit. But the main thing is because we don't have these legal avenues, uh, I think the, 
the concern of, of kind of a wild west atmosphere uh, is, you know, for the ran for the ranchers, you have violation of property rights. I mean, these are the kind of things that really, really rile up people justifiably because you know they don't see that there's another that there's another solution to it. Do you want me to do yeah. one? Okay. Yeah. So when you guys both stand up there, you make arguments that are fairly parallel to each other. And we do. And, and I guess I just wonder, what are the political dynamics that are withholding this from happening? I mean, this, to me, this is one of those issues where, in reality, many people agree on this subject. And I would say the majority in general in the United States agree on how to resolve this issue in, 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 like, in, at its overarching levels. Why is this always pushed off and stopped within Congress? Like, wh who, are the, who are the parties that are either lobbying, or is it strictly just the, you know, the rhetoric? What is holding this back? Well, I would say that the biggest and most controversial issue is what to do about the people who are over here illegally. That is by far the most, it, and it's a little bit like, you know, if you, go, if, you, if you take a road trip and you get completely lost and you ask someone for directions and they say, well, it'd be a lot easier if you didn't start, you know, from here. And that's the problem we have in the immigration system is, is if you were starting from scratch, uh, I think there would be a lot more rational discussion about, okay, what would we do to allow people to come in and work legally? What could we do with the high end? There's even you know, green room through public and Democrats on, on the per country limit, for example, was passed in the House. Uh, but I think the, the problem with what to do about the people here illegally is a threshold question that people have made it almost kind of a moral issue. If you, you know, if you violated the law, you shouldn't be allowed to get legal status. And um, it's not a uniform position in the Republican Party, but you know, it's a position of Republicans have Largely, the Republican caucus has taken. Uh, I think it's I think it's cost them with Hispanic votes to some extent uh, that we're seeing some of the polling between Romney and, and, and Obama, on, you know, on, on the immigration issue. Uh, again, I, I mean, I think you can take a rational position, like I think I'm taking, which is if you get other types of reforms and it's part of a political compromise that you do something about the people here here illegally, but that's really been the main stumbling block. And on the other hand, the Democrats have mostly been only interested in doing legalization. Uh, so that's where you've seen, you know, seen, seen the difference. I would say a couple things. Um, one, you may have noticed that in Washington, it's hard to get much of anything done. So immigration is not unique there. Um, you find problems that, you know, we could come to agreement, say, on Increasing the number of temporary work visas for a guest worker program between both parties, but then one party says, but I won't work for that unless you tack this on too. And what you have to tack on is a highly contentious issue. So I think that part of it is that. I think part of it is um, that we don't have consensus on what the facts are. So, you know, if we could agree, we seem to agree, but many people don't, that there's not a profound effect on the national economy, there's not a profound effect on crime levels, um, there's not a profound effect on preserving American culture or anything like that, um, it would be easier than it is now. There is the moral question. Um, there are a significant number of elected representatives who think that if you broke the law, we're not rewarding that. Um, you know, within that framework, that is what's happening in a sense, at least for the people who are not children who are rewarding what they did earlier. But what's the alternative? And you know, how, 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 much of, how large of an underclass do you want to create? And if you do it now, uh, people say, well, that's only going to attract more people to come here in the future with the anticipation that you'll do it again. I find that really unconvincing because the last time we did it was 1986 that we had an amnesty program. I don't think anybody comes to this country with a 25-year window about if I come down 25 years from now, I'll be made lawful. Um, over here. So, so I guess that discussion centered mainly around federal reform, right? But a lot of states like Arizona, Alabama have taken this into their own hands. Yes. What is the progress on that? Or is there is a reversal after the Arizona law was struck down or states are continuing to um, especially seeing the pressure that they have continuing to pass laws um, 
Yeah, so let me say a few words about the, the Supreme Court case last June, Arizona versus the United States. Um, one, several interesting things about that. First of all, resounding victory for the federal government. Okay, if you had asked me beforehand, I would have told you that I thought that there were some, at least some justices who would have said that what Arizona was doing was regulating immigrants, not immigration. That immigration is restricted to the power to let somebody in or expel somebody once they're here, but how you treat them while they're here, that's regulating immigrants, not immigration. No justice said that. Everybody thought this was immigration. Everybody almost thought that immigration is an exclusively federal power. Um, now, you've got this dissent from Justice Scalia um, saying a number of things. First, he said, you know, an essential characteristic of sovereignty is the ability to exclude. You know, how many of you grew up in Illinois? If you got into Northwestern Law School and you couldn't come here because the state of Illinois says, I won't let you in, I'll represent you, I'll take that law. <laughs> States don't have the power to exclude. He also said um, that what drove Arizona to do what it was doing was perfectly understandable and it was the refusal of the president to enforce the law. Well, one of Justice Scalia's most celebrated dissents was in a case called Morrison versus Olson, which was the independent counsel statute. And in the independent counsel statute case, he was very offended that you could have an independent counsel enforcing a law that the president couldn't enforce. He said the essence of presidential power is the ability to decide to investigate and prosecute or not investigate and prosecute. Um, what's happening on the ground now? Well, there were four provisions in the Arizona law. Three of them were struck down. You can't, as a state, make a crime something that the federal didn't make a crime that the federal government allows it. You can't regulate employees as a state when the federal government decided to regulate only employers. But what you can do, and will be the battleground now, is when you arrest somebody, you can have a show me your papers provision. If I arrest you for a non-immigration related suspected crime, I can check your immigration status if I have reasonable suspicion that you're not in this country lawfully before I let you go. So that's happening now, and I think you'll see more states adopt that. Um, it's not clear to me what the legal attack on that is. I get calls from people all the time who've been held in Cook County Jail for 24 hours on wrongful charges. I won't represent them because 24 hours before a Cook County jury is just not worth that much money. If people are held for 20 minutes longer while they're running an immigration check, um, I don't see the courts doing much about that. What you are going to have that would be an attractive case is Take the brown screen driver who's a legal permanent resident of the United States or a United States citizen and is an emergency room doctor and is on the way to the emergency room and gets stopped and gets stopped for 20 minutes longer and can't, or the couple, brown skin, going to pick up their kids, don't get to there to pick up their kids. What you're gonna see as a result of these procedures is a lot of stereotyping and a lot of racial profiling. And that's a very bad thing, but you know, under the 14th Amendment, I would have to prove not just the disparate impact, but that that was intentional. That's a tough case. So we have um, the death case, McCleskey versus Kemp out of Georgia. Plaintiffs in that case proved you were overwhelmingly more likely to get the death penalty in Georgia if you were black men than if you were white men. The United States Supreme Court said, too bad. Yeah, the ratios are way skewed, but you got to prove to me it was intentional. That's the roadblock you're up against. Driver's licenses are currently a hot issue. So with uh, DACA, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, that was President Obama's executive initiative um, to uh, say we're not going to prosecute you for a period of two years and we're going to give you a work authorization. Arizona has said won't give you a driver's license. Um, so that will get with you. Um, state's ability to act in this area has been narrowed, but not eliminated. Yeah. No, I guess politically, uh, Russell Pierce, who is the chief advocate of the law, the sponsor of the law, got defeated in a recall election. So, uh, you know, to, to the extent that politicians care about getting elected, yeah. Um, you know, those kind of things, 
they do pay attention to. And so to the extent that something becomes viewed as, a, as not as much of a political winner, uh, you know, that can have some effect. Or if a governor feels it tarnishes the state's reputation, that can have an effect. Uh, you know, to the extent in Georgia, we're seeing concerns about the economic impact of, of some of the provisions they've had. The all better than the fruit rotten on the vine. Now, on the, on the Arizona Commission, yeah. isn't there also, but it's not necessarily they have to be booked, right? I mean, they, they can be asked their status short of being. If you arrest them initially for or stop them for something else. Right, yes. but they don't have to be arrested, do they? Yeah, with the income, the custodial stuff. Okay. More questions over here? Uh, do you see the WTO being a more critical role on cross border movement of people as it has uh, with respect to trade and goods and so I'm sorry, what was the first the role of the WTO? WTO? The World Trade World Trade Organization. Oh, we've actually done um, a couple of legal analysis. Our, web our website, by the way, is www.nfap.com, and we have a couple of legal analysis on there on the issue of certain actions by Congress, whether they violated uh, the WTO, and, and one of them is these extra fees they put on, on uh, foreign nationals or companies particular companies that they have a certain percentage of foreign nationals in the workforce, which skews mostly towards Indian companies. Although interestingly, the Indian governments tend to have actually misread the way the rule works, and they think it's, they can, at least, the, the press comments were more that it's, that, they, that their grounds would be that they're going after Indian companies, and that's actually not the grounds that would be successful for a WTO case. Uh, it, would, it would be different grounds. It would be, the grounds would be, that the extra fee is like a two thousand dollar fee on, on companies, on these certain types of companies, would end up. Um, the intention of it was to limit the number of people getting these visas. That would be if you were able to convince a WTO panel of that, then you might have a chance of winning. And the winning would be that then India or any other country would be able to either get the U.S. would either have to change the law, or they'd act or India would be able to do something equally stupid um, to the United States. I mean, that's, that's the way the WTO system works. Do you have a question over here? How would you feel as far with the legalization part? Uh, what's that affect for the other, like the O1 visas, H1, H2A visas even? Like, if, so if they had gone through the process and they've done so legally, and then the people who have, have gone through the process illegal, maybe we can, you know, we can go away from the people who have been here for but who have arrived recently, how does that affect people who have, you know, the fact you have to people in the legal way and the illegal way, and can you, would you extend that to N1 visa as well? Well, an H visa is a temporary visa by yeah. definition, yes. right? Um, so I'm not sure that they're conflicting. Uh, no, no, I, I, I think his point he's getting at is kind of, the, again, gets this moral issue, is you have people who, who came in the, the right way and people who came in the wrong way, and are you rewarding the people who came in the wrong way versus the people who came in the right way? Is that say, yeah, say yeah. I, I would have, I, if I ch ch chosen to apply for a permanent, got me a card, I would have. I just knew that legally it wasn't possible. Right. So instead of going the legal route, I chose to just and then go for the temporary. Right, right. I mean, these are these are tough calls. I mean, I mean the problem from um, and often in these cases, you know, the, the federal government is going to say the people who came in as of a certain time, so. The, the longer you've been here, you build up um, equities. I mean, the problem from the Republican point of view, politically, I see that if, if I don't know if all of you are familiar with the with the story or play or now another movie, Les Miserables, but essentially the Republicans seem to, or some Republican lawmakers at least, feel that that you know position they want to take is this Inspector Javert. You know, Inspector Javert and Les Miserables, you know, were someone for stealing a loaf of bread. They would end up going to prison eventually. 20 years, and his big thing is the law is the law is the law. Well, you know, so that seems to be what some Republican lawmakers feel that should be the position to take. The problem with that is if you watch or read or anything with Lemus Arabla, Inspector Jover is, is, is not the most popular character <laughs> in the story. People are not overly sympathetic, you know, cheering for him to get those, you know, poor people and, and keep them, you know, in prison as long as possible. You know, I don't think there's there might be a person who does that, but I think the story is geared more around the sort of, sort of sympathetic, more sympathetic characters. So that's really the political call, though, that's been made by Republicans. 
again, not all of them, but, but has been just kind of do the sort of the pure law and order, um, you know, idea. And I think that, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I mean, I don't know that if, if, if Mitt Romney's elected, that, you know, how far he's going to go down this, this path. He's made a lot of statements that indicate, uh, you know, indicate he won't. So, and I don't think, and, and, and if you don't go down that path, I don't think you're going to get these legal temporary visas at the lower end as well. So I think, you, you, you know, you potentially just see more, more gridlock. More questions? Yeah, I was just curious, what, what is the wage rate that the, um, I guess the farmers are guaranteeing to the migrant workers, that, and then what are they, in fact, getting paid from your state? Well, it varies from state to state, and it varies on what kind of crop or work you're doing. But for instance, uh, we have a case now in Wisconsin where the adverse effect of the wage rate was nine and a quarter an hour, and they were getting into seven. Now, I found out the high end, I once did an analysis where I looked at all the Labor Department actions on H on H-1B visas at the high end. And it was very interesting. There were a handful of these cases where someone was getting paid, like underpaid, like $10,000, you know, maybe something like that. But there are many more of the cases that, again, these were final agency actions. So these are kind of unusual cases to some extent, you know, not just their representative. But even among those cases, I found the difference in pay was about 2,000 or so. Uh, which is interesting, uh, maybe for, maybe for this, a season or yeah, maybe no, for like during the, the period of cover, maybe two to four thousand, which I thought was interesting because you know that you weren't looking at the legal costs and other things that people. It wasn't clear that in those kind of cases, employers were really gaining any advantage, and, it, and to some extent, it made me wonder, you know, how much of it is confusion even the rules versus you know, malicious action. In other words, there were the folks who were just, yeah, I'm gonna, like, you know, like your cases where I'm just gonna underpay, you know, I don't, I don't care. But I think there's a lot more, at the high end at least, there's a lot more of the cases where there is a lot of, there is some confusion and open to interpretation of what the rule is. A lot of people who hire people on H-1Bs don't hire, like, tons of them. You know, they may only hire, you know, a handful or a couple. And so, you know, have, you know knowing exactly the rules. Uh, I think the bigger problem for people at the high end is is if you're going through the green card process, then you get stuck into this process of not being able to maybe change jobs or feeling you maybe don't want to change jobs or in some cases even accept promotions because it could re-trigger the start of your green card application again. And that's one reason. So people who who say they're concerned about exploitation, uh, you know, want a solution at the high end at least. It would be to to make it so you solve the screen card problem, so that people don't feel that they, you know, you know, don't don't want to leave their job. I should say, this paying less than the mandated hourly is not the only way you can exploit people. You can not pay them overtime. Uh, lots of workers work on piece rate rather than by the hour. You can have a not very accurate way of calculating their piece rate and then pay them. There are a bunch of ways to do it. More questions over here. We're just following up on what you guys were talking about, about visas in the high end uh, and maybe reforms to make it a little bit easier for them to get the green card. Would you suggest that one of those reforms is to get rid of the sponsorship uh, application in general? And then maybe someone, just by having their PhD or having uh, some type of graduate degree, can apply for a green card? How do you, or what exactly do you think should be the, the reform? Because we see that. Sponsors and having that sponsors really is what made us uh, enslaved to that employer. So would you get rid of the sponsorship, you know, duty in general, or would you uh, uh, just hand out how, what is the criteria to hand out, you know, green cards to people just for having a PhD? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I would say that I, I mean there are there is a narrow category of folks like writers and things that are able to self petition. I would say that that I, I don't think it's a good idea to get rid of the employer aspect of it. I think they're actually the main advocates for getting more green cards. And once someone gets a green card, after a short period of time, they can go to another employer. People don't get into, you know, it's not a bonded situation. I mean, you can leave after a, you know, sure. six months but or a year. Sure, but prior to the green card, you're in bondage to that. Well, again, I, I don't say if, if someone's paying, 
but in some cases, the employers are paying forty thousand dollars just for you to go through the process for you to stay permanently. So um, certainly, at the good for the good employers, uh, you know, it's something they feel they have they're, they're doing because they want this employer to stay with them long term. The problem with going away from this is the the the, the folks who push that a bit more on that you have a point system, not the kind of point system you're talking about, but a point system for regulating almost everyone to come into the country. And when they did that in like the 2006 and 2007 in Congress, uh, the problem is it really was designed as a way to eliminate family immigration. That was really their goal in, in Congress, John Kyle and some others who just felt that they wanted to have people come in based on this idea whether you have a PhD and, and other things. The problem is when they put it all together, it created really bizarre outcomes. Um, you know, there are tons of jobs that don't aren't at the PhD or master level, like nurses, for example. Basically, a nurse would probably never qualify <laughs> under under a point system. There's someone very valuable in the economy, uh, especially now, but they wouldn't. So you'd end up with like in Canada. There's one of the disagreements with the Canadian system is you get people who aren't necessarily a good match to the labor market. You know, the PhD cab driver type uh, scenario. I mean, one of the best ways to tell if someone's going to fit in well in, 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 in the US labor market is someone actually wants to hire them. And, and the fact that someone's willing to maybe spend $40,000 for them to go through the process is a pretty good indication that someone finds them valuable enough, you know, that they'd like them to stay here. I don't have any clients at the higher end. At the lower end, the problem seems to me a lot easier with sponsorship. At the higher end, you know, I, I don't have the experience, but I'm speculating that the more sophisticated your skill is, the less fungible you are with somebody else. And I would, by inclination, be very averse to have a central planning system where the government decides how many PhDs we're gonna have without regard to how many employers want. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me or for the government to say, you can have this person because we pre-screen this person. At the lower end of the wage scale, for instance, for harvesters or for people who work in seafood canneries, the labor is much more fungible. And we could have employers say to the government, you need, this is how many people I need, and the next guy says this is how many people they need. Often the farms are next to each other, the canning plants are, and then the workers come and the employers could bid for them with the employees, right? And you don't have much of a problem with sponsorship then. Employee, goes with one farmer and doesn't like a grower, he can switch to the next one. And then hopefully the other grower improves its policies. I think we have time for one last question. So just playing on that particular theme for us, the employers at the PhD level, um, so you see down in the so Bay area, there are a lot of people who have higher level studies, higher level studies and they also start their own firms. You mentioned entrepreneurial spirit. Um, does, is the definition of employer a very fixed one in the traditional sense? You know, so employment, what have you? Or could a, a venture capital firm actually bond someone in this in scenario? I mean, under the current law, they can't really. Um, you know, there, there are proposals in Congress uh, to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, that would certainly be one other way. Right now, the only way is sort of more like a, there's something called EB-5. And it's really not an entrepreneur visa, it's more an investment visa. And it's really more if, say, someone has a, a shopping mall gambling casino type venture and they're breaking it up into investment portions and someone's able to give $500,000 towards that, they're able to get a green card out of it. Perfectly legitimate way to attract foreign investment, but it's not entrepreneurial. And I think what you're talking about, would, it does take a change in the law. So that's focused on a foreign investor wanting to be stateside. Right. No, Even though in hard. theory someone could do it, I think when people start thought of it in Congress, they were thinking it would be what you're talking about. But in practice, most I mean, uh, I mean, the two of us could start a company tomorrow with no capital, based on just a revenue stream that we anticipate based on services. But you know, so you don't need to have five hundred thousand dollars, particularly in America today, to start to start a business. It's a category if you want to bring capital. There's no category if you want to bring an idea. Right. I want to thank you.
Lots of tools. Thanks, everybody.